So we have actors, we have a player, now we have a level. The one thing that we are still missing is how all of that really comes together and how we can implement our final gameplay logic. And what do I mean by that? Well, in the previous part, if you followed that along, we made this cutscene. But as you can see, during that cutscene and during our uh, just standing around here, this first block is already moving and by the time we get there, we need to wait for it to move down and that's just not very good level design. So what we could do is we could make this thing move a fair bit faster, so something like 120, right? We could do that. But instead, let's actually set this to zero so that it doesn't move at all in the beginning of the level. And then we will dynamically change the movement speed variable through something called the level blueprint. So if we come up here, we can open our level blueprint. And that just opens up a blueprint like any other actor that you might be used to. But this is the blueprint specifically for this level. So we can get any objects in this level and get a reference to it and do some scripting regarding that. So we'll select this little elevator that we have here going into our level blueprint. We can right click and create a reference to that specific instance of that actor. Don't worry too much about the from persistence level. That's about level streaming, which we'll probably get into at some point in the mid to near future. And from here, we can get and set the movement speed, which seems like I misspelled. And we can set that to whatever we want specifically for only this instance again. So all of these actors, which are based on the same blueprint, will not be affected by this. It's literally only this object. And we can set that to, it was a little bit slow, so actually do set to like a 110. But now, how do we activate this? Because if we just hook this up to begin play, we're back at where we started. It's moving when we don't want it to move yet. So that's where some other fun things come in. Going back to our place actors, again, if you don't have that, go up to window. You can enable the place actors window here. We can add in a trigger volume. In this case, let's go for a trigger box. And if we put that in the level, we get our box extent, just like we do with uh, a collision box, for instance, in an actor. But this one is specifically meant to be placed in levels. So we can place that wherever we want. This seems about correct. Let's place it around here so that it has no collision with anything else. And then while selected, going into our level blueprints again, we can, instead of creating a reference to it, we can call the events that this thing generates. And of course, it has an on actor begin overlap event, as any actor does. And with that, we now have an event that we can use to enable the movement speed here. If you want to be very thorough and make sure that this only ever happens when the player is overlapping this, for instance, if you have enemies in the area walking around as well, you don't want those to be able to trigger the trigger box. The easiest and most simple way is to just get the other actor pin here and cast that to your third person character blueprint. That way, whatever we put after this will only happen if this trigger box is being triggered by the player character. And now we'll see, again, this cuts in place, but our block over there doesn't move yet until we trigger this box, at which point it does move, and it does move a little bit too fast. So we can probably put this a little bit closer to there. And now it only starts moving when we really get close to it, and it just starts to go up in time for us to jump onto it, and that just makes the whole flow of the level a fair bit more player friendly. And you can surely imagine that you can use this level blueprint for literally anything that you want. Anything you can do in a actor, you can do in this, and potentially even more, because you have things like these trigger boxes that you can reference. So maybe we want to have a second trigger box here. Uh, let's place that over here. And let's make another event overlap for that. Check if we're overlapping the player character. And instead of playing the cutscene at the beginning of the level, what we can do is we can select 
this little sequence player over here. And with that selected, of course, we can now create a reference to that in our level blueprint. And from that reference, we can play the sequence player. We can play that animation. So now, instead of at begin play, so we need to turn off the auto play here, of course. When we start the level, it doesn't automatically play, but when we start going forward, it now plays the cutscene, showing us the level, and then we can get moving with the level itself. And as you can see, the elevator block still isn't moving, because of course, what we just added doesn't even interact at all with either of those other two actors in our level. Now, one important thing here is that since we're using a player start actor, and we're not just putting our blueprint in the level itself, we have a hard time getting a reference to our player. So if we want to change something on our player in this level blueprint for whatever reason, that's going to be a little bit tricky, but not entirely impossible. So let's stick with me here. Uh, let's use this trigger box to both make this thing move and increase our player's jump. And then put another trigger box over here to then decrease our player's jump. Again, back to what it used to be. So going into our level blueprint, first and foremost, um, let's put this trigger box up here somewhere because we're not gonna be using that anymore. And we can add an overlap event. And again, we're casting the third person character. And as such, we don't need a direct reference to our player character because we're checking the other actor here. And the other actor is just a generic actor reference. Then casting is just checking, is this generic actor reference, does that fit within this specific type of actor? We've talked about actor hierarchy before. And if it does, so in this case, if it is the player, this output pin then becomes a reference, a variable to that specific type. So in this case, BP third person character, meaning that while we cannot get the character movement components from this reference, if we do the same thing here, we can get the character movement. And that is what allows us to change the jumping. So let's do that here as well and uh, get the character movement, which is all the way down here. And from there, we can get the Z jump velocity. And let's put that into a variable so that we can save it and reset it back to whatever it was in our next trigger box. That way we don't have to hard code values. And if we change it in one place, now we have to change it in 50 places. Uh, just storing it somewhere to be used later is probably a better idea. So we can right click this pin and just simply promote to variable. It's automatically called Z jump velocity. I think that will do nicely. And we will also set the jump Z velocity. And here I actually got to check what the original value is to know what we should set it to. So let's go check that in our third person character real quick in our character movements. If we just type in jump Z, our jump Z velocity is 700 by default. So let's set that to 1200 here. So now we'll be jumping almost twice as high after we have overlapped with this trigger box. And then with this other trigger box, which again, this is the trigger box that will increase our jump height. And this is the trigger box that then will again decrease that jump height, which actually let's make that a little bit wider so the player can't go like past it and break the rest of our level. We'll just set the jump Z velocity to the variable where we stored it in before. And I'll tell you right now, there is a one issue with this code that we have made here. There's one thing that we can do in the level itself to break this system, which isn't great. I'll let you think about what that is for a second. And now let's go play it and I'll show you. So we trigger the cutscene again through that trigger box. That's all fine. That works. And our jump is still relatively low. But then when we trigger this, we can see our jump is significantly higher. And when we jump through this, our jump goes back to being lower. So what allows us to break things? Well, I'll show you. Uh, <laughs> I died, so now I need to 
watch the cutscene again, which, that's another thing, you don't want to have to re-watch the cutscene a number of times. I didn't even think about that, but that's definitely another thing we want to uh, fix in a moment here. But what we can do is, when this jump height is set higher, if we enter the trigger box again, now that variable we have made has stored the higher value. So when we try to restore our jump height, and I jumped off the level, so that's not great, but I'll just show you here. We go through this, get our jump height set to 1200, exit it, and then when we go back through it, our jump height is already set at 1200. But this little thing here, this temporary variable, is now getting overwritten with that new jump height. So when we then go through this trigger box, we're not getting reset back to 700, because our temporary variable has been set to 1200 now. The easiest way for us to deal with this at the moment is to select this trigger box over here. And when we overlap with it, we create a reference to it. And we simply just destroy this actor at the very end of it. So this trigger box will do what it needs to do and then disappear from the level. That way we can't overlap with it a second time and do some kind of weird stuff. And the same thing goes for triggering this cutscene, right? We don't want to re-trigger this cutscene by walking backwards. So after it's done everything it needs to do, we can simply destroy this exit. So I'll show you again. We trigger the cutscene, and by the time this cutscene is playing, the trigger box that we just triggered already is gone now. It doesn't exist anymore. It has been destroyed. So if I walk back and I walk forwards again, the cutscene doesn't get triggered again. Because if we go into F8 mode here, and we show collisions, there we go, that's the trigger box. Uh, you can see the trigger box that was here a moment ago doesn't exist anymore. Let's go back into our game here. Now we have triggered our jumping boost. And you can see the other trigger box now as well is gone. So that's how you can use trigger boxes in combination with level blueprints. And of course, in a level blueprint, any functionality on any actor that you have made, you can actually access. Like the movement speed we have on this block over here, we could change that through the level blueprint. We can even change the movement distance or the direction if we wanted to. But there's one final piece to the puzzle that you're going to want to understand. But this video has been long enough as it is, so we're going to spin that off into its own separate bonus video here. And we're going to be talking about event dispatchers and how you can link together events on specific instances of objects using your level blueprints. But that'll be next time. So thanks for watching for now. And a very big thank you to all of my patrons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. And a special thank you to Eleanor for supporting at the Cave Digger tier on Patreon.